Congratulations. We have Thank uh, you very much. We have uh, we have successfully gone through a spoiler-free episode for the first time. It's out of respect for this movie. Yeah. Congratulations, Jim. This is the first <laughs> Of our 90 episodes of the Untitled Film Project podcast that do not spoil anything. So it's a milestone. Yes. Heretic. It's the Untitled Film Project podcast where you go see the movie, then come see us as we talk about this uh, A24 psychological horror thriller. Fits several categories. You like pie? Yeah. My wife has pie in the oven. I could tell that you are a very spiritually curious person. I think it is good to be religious, to find your faith in a doctrine you actually believe. <laughs> well, our work here is done. <laughs> now, I, I will go and check on the pie. So sleep, silence, You may have noticed, if you've watched or listened to us before, that we're down one person. Justin Bradford, under the weather today, unable to make it. Uh, we wish you the best and lots of chicken soup. Pour one out for Brad. <laughs> for our sick homie. He's not dead. <laughs> he's just he's sick. Just sort of, yeah, he's just, uh, and then we're, so uh, we're thinking about you, Bradford. So the, the big question today, by the way, on this episode, on every episode of the Untitled Film Project podcast, we ask the big question. The big question, of course, is meant for if you've seen the movie, if you've not seen the movie, excuse me, we do spoilers and stuff, so we want you to kind of take us along with you on the ride home from the theater, those kinds of things. Now that you've seen the movie, you come listen, right? All that. But there's still value in every single episode because you can always fast forward to the big question. And this big question on this one, Jim, is what is your favorite split personality movie character? <sighs> there's well, some good ones out there. And I think some that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Sure. So we would love to hear your input, but we'll get to that a little bit later in the show. All right, let's get some initial takes on the two Mormon evangelists who uh, end up at the house of Hugh Grant, who, guess what? He'd love to talk to them <laughs> about everything they have to say. Please come inside. Uh, what did you uh, have as an initial take on this movie? Well, let me give you an initial take on the premise of Mormon missionaries. This is not controversial, I promise. I dated a Mormon girl in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, her name was Rochelle. Um, she was amazing. And she would tell me about, you know, she educated me about what missionaries are, right? There's two of them that go together. Yep. They usually are on bikes, so they walk and they've got back book bags and they wear the same shirt and tie. And, you know, I'm like, oh, what do they do? You know, she educated me all that. I'm 15, 16. I didn't know, you know? Yeah. So, my point of saying all that is to this day, I still honk and wave at them when I see them because I, I know how hard that I can imagine how hard that job is. Yes. And you're yeah. met with all kinds of rude, which we see actually in the film. slam doors. Yes. You know, uh, negative responses. Yeah, for sure. So I just like to, you know, bring them a little bit of joy for two <laughs> seconds where I honk, wave, they always wave back. And it's just, you know, anyway. So that's my initial take on the, on the more mysteries. The more, the initial take on the film is uh, I love, a movie that makes you think, Jim, uh, and you, especially a fictional one. Mm -hmm. That's why I love documentaries because they are obviously you know <laughs> deep in fact, <laughs> right? You know, they're using archive right. footage, those kinds of things. Biopics, I love those. We talk about Bob Marley, One Love, of course. That's one of my favorite movies of the year so far. So when a fictional one comes along and makes me think, especially to this level, it is a treasure. Heretic had me thinking from start to finish. And I mean that literally from the opening lines of the two missionaries on a bench yep. to the final, let's to not ruin the spoilers just yet. The final scene. Okay. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. Heretic is awesome. Yeah. I love me an intellectual yeah. psychological thriller horror. I mean, really it didn't even get to be horror in many traditional ways until you get to like the third act. But, and even then it's yeah, iffy. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, as a, as a person of faith myself, usually when I see, uh, you know, faith being questioned or just different arguments being made in film, uh, it's either it's condescending, uh, it's oversimplified, it's uh, unkind 
to the people uh, who believe. And I, I thought it was absolutely remarkable. Uh, I thought this movie uh, left the, you know, uh, the Mormons uh, in this movie coming out as, as looking smart, dedicated, wonderful people. Uh, it does challenge pretty much every belief that is out there. So, if, it's an Jude, equal opportunity offender, if you absolutely. will. Absolutely. I mean, it's Judaism, Judaism Christianity, uh, Islam, you know, Islam, uh, the Mormon faith. Uh, if you believe we're living in a simulation, if you, <laughs> if there, if you're an atheist, yeah. you get challenged in this movie, uh, and all at the same time with this incredible tension that just left me like. Oh my God, what am I watching? I felt I was the characters. I was going through the same things they were. I was just blown away by this movie. One of my favorites of this year. Okay, let's get deeper into the details on Heretic, the latest uh, horror movie from, I'm using that word loosely because there's just so many things, from A24. Uh, you know, I was incredibly impressed with the sense of humor this movie has. Every joke hit. Everyone. And it doesn't have a ton of them, but it has them in just the right spots. Every good horror movie gives you that chance to exhale. I would argue it consistent, though. Okay. I would argue consistent laughs. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, they were really funny. They were grounded in like kind of pop real world references. Um, and like there was something about that that made it more real than if everybody was serious the whole time. Could not agree more. Uh, this is such an interesting movie to write because yes. of what you talked about earlier about how it challenges all different types of faith, even atheism, right? Mm-hmm. It's, so it's you're, you're all, no matter where you land on that pendulum, you're going to be thinking in this, which is already accomplishment number one, as opposed to just right. taking one religion and just drilling down on it. And right, you know, it, it, it's everybody. But the second thing is what you just said: the fact that there is so much humor in it that is funny. Like, so okay. So for those who don't know. When we see these screeners, okay, there's somebody who stands out. Ours is our girl's Chrissy. She's awesome. Shout out to Chrissy. Awesome. Uh, so there's a, there's somebody who stands outside the theater after the screeners are over for the media, and they take like you know I don't know three four thoughts on the film, so they can send them back to the production company or whoever is asking for it. They can get some initial feedback yeah. and what uh, audiences and critics are saying. Yeah, they can gauge the audience right. So before it actually releases to a theater. So I bring that all out to say that. The only thing I could come up with to say for Chrissy, Jim, was it was terrifyingly funny. (laughs) And I didn't know that could exist in the same project at the same time. You will laugh. Yep. And uh, if you are, let's just say, uh, fragile Mm -hmm. in your beliefs, Mm -hmm. it could shake you a bit. I agree with that. and And I'm not saying that everything that is spoken in this movie is fact or the challenges are, you know, valid challenges to release beliefs and systems like that. But like it, like I said, if you're not ready to be challenged in your thoughts and beliefs, this movie will challenge you. I'm glad you brought up the writing because uh, the dialogue is so taut Mm. and perfect in this movie. There's three characters basically in this movie, the entire film. I mean, really for all intents and purposes. So uh, the dialogue was written so well and Hugh Grant performed that dialogue to perfection. His delivery of always smiling and I'm interested in what you want to tell me and I'd like to know more, but he's also using that curiosity and as bait to pull them into a situation that they might not ever get out of uh, was, was just amazing. Uh, He plays on all of their weaknesses of somebody who wants to share the faith and he uses it against them in a diabolical way with this big smile on his face. (laughs) But it takes a nuanced actor of Hugh Grant's caliber. Mm -hmm. You can see over Jim's shoulder, by the way. Uh, uh, It takes a nuanced actor like him of his caliber to 
play that character because any lesser actor would have just done it creepily or yes. would have done it uh, sinister or you would have known something's coming. Ooh. You know something's coming, but you have no idea what. And yeah. and the fact that, again, he pulls off some of these jokes. He educates you about how there was a song from the 50s or 60s that was basically r- ripped off by Radiohead and Creep. And then he says, oh, you're, you're too young to remember who Creep is? Okay, fine. Then Lana Del Rey did a song that was then. Like, it, it's all these different layers. And he's casual when he's talking. Yeah. So he sits down and he looks genuinely interested. You know, something's up, obviously, because you're going to see a psychological thriller. But if you had no idea what it was going in, you would be like, hmm, something seems off. But you wouldn't know what it was. And then just when you start to really start to raise your eyebrows about his intentions, he does something disarming. Yes. You know, makes a joke, makes you laugh, makes them more comfortable. Oh, of course, that's right. It's against your rules for for you to do this. So I'm going to do this thing that makes you feel comfortable again and lowers your guard. And the same thing is happening to you as an audience member while you're watching it. Uh, Let's talk about the the, the girls uh, playing Sister Barnes and Sister Paxton, Mm -hmm. uh, Chloe East and Sophie Thatcher. One of them, Sophie Thatcher's character, uh, is a little more world-wise, maybe, uh, and has a little harder of an edge, uh, but still a believer. She's seen some stuff. Yeah. She's been through some stuff. Her dad died, things like that. Exactly. And uh, Sister Paxton is the more naive and less worldwide you know uh very sheltered life yes yeah and you know so it makes for this 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 really great kind of push pull between the two of them you know trying to spread their faith but at the same time one of them's got their antenna up and the other one's kind of you know whistling in the graveyard here you know and not really knowing the dangers that kind of lurk no but they both play it so well yes. that they give you that contrast. And it's right up front. I said earlier in the show that, you know, I, I was, I believed it from the beginning of the show that I was thinking from the beginning to the end. This is another example because Chloe East and Sophie Thatcher played it so well. It yes. was written so well, but I mean, you yep. have two characters that play it so well, yeah. especially over time. Yeah. Throughout the film that I was rooting for the characters Immediately. If, yes. if they just, if, if you, if you pick up the movie, okay, it comes out from the opening credits, which by the way, were awesome, by the way, <laughs> never seen opening credits in a triangle like that it was really awesome. It was great. Subtle nerd things. I know, but still, it was really <laughs> cool. So if you pick it up while they're on, let's say while they're riding their bikes and it's clear they're on a Mormon mission and all that stuff, you, you, depending on your philosophical, you know, theology or whatever, right? Your, your belief system, yeah. you either, reject him and write off or you are rooting for him because maybe you're Mormon or, you know, whatever it is. Right. In this case, they, you don't really know that up front, really. And the way that they get you into it with some dialogue and a, and a conversation, that's really funny and cool and, and, and real. It's real, real people conversation. Yes. Uh, yes. Is uh, you immediately are like, I'm rooting for these two girls. I don't know what's going on, but I, I'm, I'm in it. These, right. I don't want them to go anywhere or be hurt or be hurt. Even the supposedly naive ca- character, yes. Sister Paxton, you know, just, you know, is hinting at some of the times where she's strayed. She's done something she hasn't done. I mean, we're right. not supposed to do like go on fast food and things right. like that. <laughs> I mean, and it, it's it just it just fleshes out these characters. It makes them believable. Uh, and the more believable your characters are, I think the more you feel the peril that they're in yeah. and you're rooting for them as well. For sure. All right, time to give you our scores. How good was Heretic? Let's start with uh, Jeremy Gover. Well, uh, Bradford, how would you score it? Ooh. Awesome. Okay, you have a lot to say about that. Okay. Okay, uh, that was our joke, Bradford. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, Heretic is terrifyingly funny. Like I said, uh, I, I didn't know, again, those two words could be used in the same sentence about the same thing. Uh, how does A24 consistently put out quality filmmaking while big budget studios are batting about 250. What I mean by that yeah. is even if you don't like uh a 24 movies, let's take love lies bleeding. Just for example, I, I mm-hmm. liked it. No, I wasn't entertained by it, but I mean, I liked it, the, you know, the, it enough, right. 
But I can see people in our screener, right? Remember, Jim, people walked out. They didn't like it at all. Right. Okay. So you don't like it. But you can still admit that it's quality filmmaking. Like the way right. they do it, that it's crafted, the story, the cinematography, all the pieces. Even if it's not for you. Yes. But you, yeah, you acknowledge it. You're still like, wow. Okay. So my point is, how does A20, I'm not saying they're all home runs, but what is A24 doing that, let's just say, Warner Brothers isn't doing? Why are they putting out, not garbage, but just like, you know, maybe v- very vanilla films for the most part. Some are entertaining, some are not, but they're very vanilla films. And then all of a sudden there's like that one that's like really great. And then there's four or five in yeah. a row that suck. And then there's a... It's true. I don't know how that's possible. I, I, I think it's as simple as A24 finds interesting people doing interesting things and lets them do it. Okay. I don't think this is... F- they don't focus group their movies. I don't think they go with safe bets. Uh, I think they go with smart bets. Uh, I don't uh, f- think any other studio out there is willing to take a chance on the scripts and people uh, that A24 is willing to do. Um, and it, they just got a great track record. It's it, uh, it's pretty impressive. So yeah. kudos to you, A24. That's my, my first real take on this one. Uh, the, the characters, again, again, instantly likable. Love them from the beginning. Hugh Grant is great. Sophie Thatcher is great. Chloe East is great. The board game analogies are great. Yes. The Jar Jar reference was great. <laughs> the, everything about it was great. Uh, I know we still have six months left, Jim, but as of right now, Heretic is on my Mount Rushmore of movies for 2024, and it'll take a miracle to knock it out of the number one, my, my number one vote in the Music City Film Critics Association ballot at the end of the year for best screenplay. I'm giving it an 8.5. And to be 100% honest, I don't know what the 1.5 I'm taking off is. I just know it's not better than Bob Marley, One Love, or The Wild Robot. So therefore, I'm <laughs> okay. putting it at 8.5. Right. So it's a relative thing. Yeah. Yeah. 8.5. That's pretty good. Uh, I absolutely... Uh, was drawn into this movie, and I kept asking myself, like, okay, somehow this movie is is hitting me in my DNA, right? How is it terrifying? How is it making me feel this way? Mm-hmm. And my only analogy is, if you could put it into maybe the first time you were aware enough to know what danger is and a parent read to you the story of the big bad wolf because what you're getting is two little kids coming to the big bad wolf's cabin and the and the wolf is really good at pulling those kids in and getting them to believe that it's you know grandma uh and that's what i think is going on i think in those kinds of nursery rhymes and those things that have endured over time they resonate with us for some reason and this movie taps into that beautifully uh i think that the you know acting was superb. I think every one of those characters, the of of the sisters and Mr. Reed played by Hugh Grant, if any one of those was not played to the level mm-hmm. that it was, you've got a bad movie. Uh, so kudos to the actors really executing a fantastic script. Uh, this is also on my Mount Rushmore of movies. Um, and I'm not sure, but I can't find something to pick on in this movie. Maybe there's a couple of loose threads in the third act where, you know, where they're kind of figuring out what he's doing, but we don't know why, but I almost kind of like not knowing why those things are happening. Uh, They don't explain them and it's kind of up to your imagination, which scares you more. So uh, scary, intellectual, directing, script, acting. There's so many things about this movie I thought were fantastic. I'm giving Heretic a 9.5. Mm. It is one of the best movies I have seen this year. It's, it deserves it. Like I said, I can't, I can't figure out where my 1.5 points come off of. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it's so good, you guys. You gotta yeah. go see it. Yeah. Jim, before we get to our big question, no. congratulations. We have, Thank uh, you very much. We have, uh, we have successfully gone through a spoiler-free episode for the first time. You're right. We really, we, tri- I, we really tried to wait until the scores, and then when the scores came, we, we just didn't mention it. So we're not going to ruin it now. I think it's out of respect for this movie. Yeah. 
I think so. I, we didn't even try to. We just felt it was deserved. I almost did right <laughs> off the top when I, when I was talking about the end of the film. I almost did that. <laughs> Other than that, we really did not spoil it for you. So congratulations, Jim. This is the first of our 90 episodes of the Untitled Film Project podcast that do not spoil anything. So It's a milestone. Yes. So you'll probably see that in the YouTube title. Okay. So the big question today is, what is your favorite split personality movie character? Uh, there's a lot to choose from, obviously. Yeah. Uh, you want to give us a couple examples of yours? I'm oh, sorry, a couple examples, Jim, sure. uh, that, that you're not going to name. Yeah. Because I know you're not going to name mine. Yeah, we've okay. done this before, and he's named right. it. But we're uh, going to gamble on this. Uh, you know, I will just say, like, Jim Carrey and uh, me, myself, and Irene. Perfect. Uh, Norman Bates, mm. right? He's him, Great and one. he's his mother. Uh, I mean, you psycho, can, case you should know. <laughs> yeah, you, you can even you can even stretch it and and say you know, Anakin Skywalker's got multiple personalities I like going it. on, and so it's like so like there. I mean, it's not as narrow a category, I think, as some people might think on its face. All right, so what is your answer there, Jim? All right, I'm going back to a movie I loved when I first saw it, and then I revisited this movie within the past year, okay. and it totally held up. Uh, my favorite multiple personality character in a movie is Annie Wilkes, Kathy Bates in the movie Misery. Mm. So she, you know, if you haven't seen Misery, it's a Stephen King novel made into a film, a great film with James Caan, who plays uh, uh, a writer, and uh, he gets trapped in the snow. He has an accident in a blizzard, and the person who saves him, pulls him out of his vehicle, also happens to be one of his most rabid fans. And so she's nursing him back to health and all oh, sweetie i just love you and at the same time there's this other part of her where she just snaps and does horrible things to him and like the complexity and nuance of you know kathy bates at her absolute prime and she's never gotten any less good than she was right. then but she's uh, matlock now She's Matlock, exactly. A um, little different. But really, this movie, I think, is the one that put her on the map yeah. to, and, and said, this woman is, you know, above all others in the, uh, in the acting category. Uh, she, she's just so great and so terrifying. So it kind of plays into this, you know, we've been talking about heretic, uh, you know, somebody who's got somebody else trapped in their house and they just flip back and forth and you never know when. So that's my pick. Well, that's an excellent, excellent choice. Mr. Goover. I'm going to pick Jim Carrey, but I'm going to pick Jim Carrey and Man on the Moon. Here's why. Okay. He plays Andy Kaufman in Men. Yes. Okay. But he also plays Tony Clifton because Tony Clifton was a main character by rumored by Andy Kaufman as well. Okay. Yep. And if you have not seen the man on the moon documentary, it's fascinating by the way about the movie. It is. Uh, Jim Carrey is never Jim Carrey on set while filming. He is always Andy Kaufman. People, the total method had to call him Andy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Dave Chappelle's got a great joke on, at the very, very top of The Dreamer, his Netflix special about meeting Jim Carrey. He always wanted to meet Jim Carrey. He finally met him, but when, but when he got invited to meet him, he was on the set of Men on the Moon, and he was like, <laughs> I'm looking at Jim. I know it's not Andy, and then he got pissed. Anyway, so, uh, it's, a, so it's, a, it's, it's a split personality in the sense that it's the actor so, what do they call it, method? Yeah. That he's Andy Kaufman. On set, he ch he's channeling Andy Kaufman all the time. But then the character of Andy Kaufman is also troubled and blah blah blah. But he's also doing Tony Clifton. So for me, it is Jim Carrey on Man on the Moon because it's a little bit left of center. I love that. I love that because yeah, I, I think there's there's levels of characters within Andy Kaufman too. Yes, that you could like you could say Andy Kaufman was a multiple personality uh, character. Yep. And there's, there's also the real him who, which one was it? How was it like, when is he not being a character and when is he being the real Andy Kaufman? We don't know, but there's also somebody who's playing him by Jim Carrey. So that's like <sighs> mind blowing. Love and Jim it. Carrey, of course, is one of our great actors. I don't care what anybody says. I know you got Mr. Popper's penguins. You got all these movies you can kind of shut, you know, point to that are not great, but man, 
in the mid to late nineties, early two thousands, he was one of this generation's greatest actors. Absolute classic, unreal hit list in over that and over and yes, over. Yeah, for sure. I love it. So, what is your favorite multiple personality, split personality character in a movie? There's so many to choose from. Uh, hit us up on socials. Hit us up in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. And let us know uh, who's the one we forgot that, of course, they're the best. You, you've been thinking it the whole time. <laughs> uh, let's, before we get out of here, Jim, let's bring Bradford back one more time. Yes. Okay. Bradford, um, how are you doing over there? Okay, great. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, appreciate sure. the Untitled Film Project Podcast. Sans one of our members. Thank you for listening to the Untitled Film Project Podcast. To support the show, please rate, review, follow, and subscribe. Original music by Jeremy Schwartz. Special thanks to the Music City Film Critics Association. Editing and post-production by Jeremy K. Gover. Voiceover by Chad Bennett.